Say it when you're ready.
There's no home far away in my memory Where the morning glories twine round the door Where the whipper will so softly her calling How I'd like to go back there once more Oh, it seems I can hear my mother calling From the back door in which she often stood I'm sorry There's a pathway that leads me to the garden Where my mother used to toil long, long ago On the hillside I can see the tall grass wavy Where my father tilled the soil to and fro Oh, it seems I can hear my mother calling From the back door in which she often stood I'm sorry C'est une journée très spéciale, pour surtout pour les gens ici de Rose Canard, Maison du Vert, pour ceux qui ont mis le col ici. Hey, good afternoon and welcome to, uh, to this very special day, especially for those who, especially from those from Black Broken Man and Winter Houses, and those who came to this school. I'm sure this will be a very memorable, memorable moment, I guess, for them. Um, get to one other point, I guess, if anybody would like to have a chair, we still, still do have some chairs in the back. Jarl seems to be all right standing, so. Okay. First of all, on behalf of everyone, I would like to thank all those who helped in making this dream a reality. I know there was a lot of, a lot of volunteers. Everybody played a nice part in there, very important part. I would also especially like to thank the Honorable Jim Hutter for making funds available for this project. Also to Bernie Duffany and Stan Felix, who did a tremendous amount of work and a lot of their time, of course, providing materials for this project. School was completed in 1942 and was named Our Lady of Perpetual Help by the first school teacher that taught here at the school, Ms. Kathleen Duffney. Which is an honor sure, to, to have her here with us this afternoon. As you know, the, the school was, was built in 1942, so that, that ran from 42 to 1966. And I'll just give you a list of the, uh, the teachers that taught here during those, those, those years. Okay, Ms. Kathleen Duffy, Nate McDonald, is here with us. Alice Nolesworthy, Nate, Nate Armstrong. Gertie Reardon, Nate McDonald. 
Willie Wither. Willie Withers. Okay. <laughs> Kathleen K. O'Quinn, Ne Woodrow. Welcome. Josephine Meany, Betty Flynn, Ne Ward. Geraldine Collier, Ne Green. Haley Henrietta Snooks. Owen Kwan, Vera Ryu, Jerry Benoit, Winnie O'Quinn, Bernice Meany, Barbara Young, Nay Tiffany, Gloria Benoit, Nay Piercy, Cynthia Collier, Nay March, Sylvie Oliver, Nay Gatto, Larry Mahoney, we all remember him, <laughs> Elsie Peters, Timothy Doyles, Patty March, welcome buddy, and Simon March. There were 23 teachers in the 24 years that was taught here, so I'm not sure if we had, I guess we had one teacher that's, that taught uh, for a couple of years, or I'm sure Pat Marsh was the last teacher here, and also Simon Marsh, so I don't know if that was completed that year. Um, anyway, right now we don't want to, we want to move right into the very important part of this ceremony for this afternoon. I guess that'll be the cutting of the ribbon. And we'd like to ask upon Miss K. Duffany, Miss Kathleen Duffany, to come and cut the ribbon for, for us as a symbol of reopening this school. at this school to come up and make this presentation as a token of our appreciation to Mrs. Kathleen Duffany, our first school teacher. K. Duffany, from the students of Our Lady of Perpetual Help School, we will always remember you. Oh, 
Okay, well, what we want to do next, I guess, right now is to make to ask Father Terry to come up and bless the school and the stations. Let us ask God to bless our new school. All praise to you, Heavenly Father. Lord of all creation, you have gathered us in this community to praise you by our words and works. Bless the school which we have built for your people. Bless our students and teachers who taught here over the years, our parents, employees, and all who promote sound education in our community. May our young people grow in wisdom, age, and grace before you and all your people. May the school always be a home of truth, and wisdom, faith, and goodwill towards all. Through the prayers of Our Lady of Perpetual Help, may this school help our community and build your kingdom of justice, light, and peace. Loving Father, listen to our prayer which we offer through Christ our Lord, in your Holy Spirit. All glory to you, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thank you, Father. Now we can get the teachers up and we'll have a class this afternoon, eh? <laughs> Where's Larry Mahoney now? <laughs> Homework's on the board. <laughs> Homework's on the board up there, that's right. Okay, if any of the, first of all, if the, any of the former students have any pictures that's not included on the wall up there, uh, we'd appreciate it if you'd like to have, pass a copy on to Diane and we'll certainly include it in the, in the display, okay? We also have a, well, we have an open mic for the, for the rest of the, the time that we're going to be over here. If anyone would like to come up and share some stories or memories that we've had while going to the school, uh, certainly welcome to, to come up and do that at any time. Maybe I could share with you one little, I have many memories from this school. I came here till I was grade six. That's where I got all my schooling from. All right, today. <laughs> but anyway, um, grade two, Larry Mahoney, I guess. Uh, I remember Larry, but anyway, he bought a, he was boarding at home with the mom and dad's and the house, and, and he bought a, uh, a German Shepherd dog. And this was, I get, he got it in the fall, so this was about, uh, I'd say February, I guess, when the ice, when the gulf was, was covered over with ice. And one morning before, before we started class, the dog ran off on the ice. And before we knew it, he almost disappeared out there, so he had to go save his dog. So what he did, he asked the whole class to go out and chase the dog till we found him. And I can remember, you know, looking back at the shore and looking at the land. The shore must have been out sick and not out there. <laughs> you could hardly see the land, and you know, after we come ashore and found the dog, Leo Duffany was the one that grabbed him before he almost jumped off into the water. And uh, we were here, and I was thinking after, you know, what if the winds would have changed, you know, to the south? Certainly winds, the whole community would have been just dragged off, dragged off out into the, to the Gulf. I'm telling you, we'd be a lot smaller today than we are now, though I guess. But anyway, that's only one of my stories. But uh, if anyone would like to come up and the teachers also, of course, you're, you're all invited to do this. Is that. There's also some refreshments at the back there if you'd like to have a sandwich or a bottle of water or whatever. Thank you very much. I'll see you go. Before we do that, we will, we will still have the open mic, but I think maybe we should get Bernie up here to do a little financial report for of the expenses that have been done so far today. We don't have too much to report. Not too much more yet. <laughs> anyway, before I start, I want to thank everybody who uh, 
made donation and helped in any way at all. We had a good fundraising committee, and I want to thank them all for helping them. Uh, first of all, last fall we got we received almost ten thousand dollars from the municipal affairs, but most of that had to go in labor. We had I think twenty five percent left for material. It wasn't very much because the windows cost about over two thousand dollars, and we had to repair the roof and we shingle it and clapboard the building. But our fundraising committee raised. Uh, just about three thousand uh, dollars. We uh, that's with the donations and everything. <clears throat> and but we still got a lot to do. We still have to build the porch. We still have to build the outhouse. We can't, you know, can't leave that out. <laughs> and uh, of course, we have to clapboard the rest of the school. And we uh, little knick next here and there. Anyway. Uh, we're still looking for contributions, and we have a little box there down the back. Anybody want to give a thousand dollars here? There, no problem. <laughs> we have envelopes out there, and if you want to put your name on the envelope, so we can keep track of everybody who donates, uh, and we'll pre, uh, put them in our little book we have down there. Um, well, one person I have to uh, to thank here is. Uh, I like to thank everybody, but there's too many to thank. But one person is uh, Ruth Felix, who just donated $500, and that's going to get us started on our porch. So I want to give her a hand. Uh, <laughs> uh, I guess that's about it. We don't have any more money. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, we hope by the time this is over, we'll have, be able to start our uh, work on the school again. And for anybody else who want to give, we want to thank you, and for all those who gave, thank you. Thank you, Bernie. Well done. Well said. Okay, we still have the open mic, and if anyone would like to come up and uh, share some memories with us, uh, quite welcome to do so. Good afternoon. Father and everybody else, children. <laughs> Uh, I, I've been to school here for eight years. I went to school here, and uh, all I remember is grade four. <laughs> and uh, I never had a seat. And a lot of people ask me, why, how many did I have a seat? Why, well, I stood in the corner all day. <laughs> and anyway, by saying this stuff like this, I'm going to read a little paper here that I have that I'd like to read. I have a great honor to, to be able to do this. So it starts off, many of the students who attended this one-room school had previous memories of a wonderful family. <clears throat> who lived in a large reddish brown house just a minute away from here. This kitchen was the shelter for freezing wet, thirsty, or hungry children who would uh, line up around their hot stove on a cold morning waiting for the school here to warm up. Recess and dinner hours, they would gather there for a drink of water and sometimes a piece of fresh bread and butter. And you know, sometimes too, a uh, homemade jam. Annie was always, I'm sorry, Annie always welcomed everyone with a warm smile and an open heart. This is a memory that will never be forgotten for those who attended this one room school. I know, I was going to skit. It gives me a great honor, a great pleasure, <coughs> and a great opportunity to dedicate Our Lady of Petrol Help School to the memory of Andy and to Rose Dutton. That way, family. Thank you. Thank you, That was well spoken. Thank you very much. Well, my name is Pat March. I started teaching here in 1963 or 4, right, Rob? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in, this, in this particular room, I had 27 students. The person who sat there 
roasted in the winter time. The person who sat there froze, <laughs> right? Uh, had a lot of good memories. Must have been very positive because I went on and finished a career in teaching. And hit my wife, who was a teacher as well. My teacher, who in grade six, six is sitting right there, Mrs. O'Quinn. She had a positive effect on me. Uh, I think Diane, Diane uh, Felix was over here in grade nine for a couple of months. We had a few hard cases. There was an altar there, and there was a, the, the whole outfit for saying mass. But a, a couple of hard cases decided, without my knowledge, to make some home brew. <laughs> and it was fine until it popped. <laughs> and stain the cloth. But you know what? I was scared to death. But miraculously, the lady next door said nothing, not boo about it, just washed it, put it back on the altar, and no one knew the difference but me. And her name was Amy Gerald. And I remember that yet to this day. You know, students uh, were, you know, weren't like students, if you've seen throughout your whole career, but they were good students, they listened. We weren't the best teachers, however, you know. And it's not just because we only made $97 a month. It's just because we weren't trained. I mean, it was terrible. Things that, the slapper and everything else, it was part of it, right? But uh, I used to walk down from Lourdes, and a few times I had to crawl in through the window here because I forgot the key or something, right? But the kids used to pick up wood, and we used to compete with the students down in Black to Brook and races and stuff like that. And I remember one, the, the saddest day, I think, was the last day when I saw this little fellow. I gave him my baseball glove. He was dragging the glove home. His name was Andre. <laughs> he was so sad. He said, sir, you're not coming back anymore, aren't you? I said, well, school is over. We won't be seeing you anymore, will we? I said, well, yeah, you'll see us again. But he was dragging his baseball glove home. That's my memories, and I'm glad to have come here and shared it with you. Thank you. for dedicating this school to my mom and dad in their memory. Uh, like everyone else that lived here, they danced and they cried, they prayed, and did, I guess, a lot of other things here. And uh, if they're looking down today, I'm sure they'll be very proud. Thank you very much. I might think about maybe the tenth of Gerald and Annie's. <laughs> Not sure. I say, what an achievement. My God, this is unbelievable. Uh, some 15, 20 years ago, I guess, I was out at Diane's one day. Well, I was always at Diane's because she was my place of refuge when I ran away from Ron and the children. <laughs> I came out here to pick berries in summertime and get my fish for the winter and stuff. And uh, Diane and I were sitting down one day having a feed of mackerel and turnip greens and strawberries. And uh, we were talking about the school and all the students who attended, wondering where they were, what they were doing and stuff. We even talked about Bunga and Netsuk and Kalea. <laughs> and for th those who don't remember, he was in grade four geography and we wondered if they were, you know, if they still existed, they were part of our heritage. So Diane said one day, she said, Shirley, you know, my God, wouldn't it be something if we could get that school reopened? And I go, yeah. But, you know, there wasn't enough people around. Probably the, the interest wasn't there. And 
So anyway, she kept at it and kept at it over the years. Every time she called me, she says, you know, maybe if we talk to somebody, you know, somebody in the family, somebody around, and I didn't know. So uh, one day, she's, when Marie was coming home, my sister, she said, we'll get Marie at it and see what Marie's going to say. And of course, Marie was really excited. And then we talked to Bernie the Beaver. <laughs> <laughs> and Bernie really wanted to do it as well. And then a committee was formed. But I say, you know, this was Diane's idea. And I thank you, Diane, so much. My best friend since, I guess, school started here. We're always good buddies and still are. And she's, her home is still my place of refuge when I run away from Ron. <laughs> <laughs> and again, Diane, I just want to say thank you for your hug. Hi, all. Well, this is my first school that I went to, actually, when I started, and my first teacher. We're looking at right now is Patty March. My name is Hazel Young, by the way. And uh, I remember one thing about Patty that I thought was the nicest thing a person could ever do. We were all sick at the time with the flu, the kids at the house. There was four of us. And it was the Christmas party that they had for in the school and of course none of us could come down here and Patty March dropped off a bag of goodies to the house for us because we couldn't come to school that day for the party and that has stayed in my mind and I'll never ever forget it thank you and I'm the first child of Kathleen and Reginald Uffney. They met the first year she taught school here. She taught school again in 1950 because, <laughs> because um, I spent my first school days here and I remember I was five years old and go looking for my mommy and, and uh, gave my daddy and come down here to school where my mommy was. So, uh, and I remember that I made my first communion, first confession uh, here at Father Jones, who's priest here. Today. So, uh, like everybody else, I've got memories of this school too. Thank you. Hello, I'm Cynthia March Collier. I also taught here, year 59 to 60. And uh, I wasn't much more than a kid myself, I was only 17. So uh, the memory, fondest memory I have of here is I taught the kids how to go to confession and communion, right, where we were preparing for communion. So I was the priest, and all the kids were lined it up to come to confession. So this one student, Leo Duffany was his name, and he came in, he got on his knees and blessed me, Father, for I have sinned. And he had a big string of sins to tell me. I said, that's OK, Leo. You have it. You save it for the priest. It was Father Harding did. So this stuck out in my mind more than anything. <laughs>
getting closer and closer, but it was getting too easy, so I figured I'd close my eyes. <laughs> She had a pair of black, a black little low shoe on. And remember, the old nylons used to run me. And I closed my eyes and I, and she went, oh! And I looked and the knife was sticking right to the top of her foot. And I seen the nylon start to run right there. And, you know, I thought for sure I was going to get up, you know. But you know something? She looked at me and she, she gave me back the knife. She went over home to mom and, uh, and mom fixed it up for her. And she came back, she never even punished me or that. Well, when I got home. And, uh, Fifty-seven years ago, I didn't have to hold on to Dan's arms to get up over these steps. Uh, but anyway, time does that to people sometimes, unfortunately. You get arthritis and you can't get around the way you would like to. I enjoyed my years down here very much. And looking over at Bernie Duffney right now, <laughs> I had him in grade one. At that time, every afternoon, Bernie took a snooze. <laughs> I would just get down on the desk and I'd say, thank God I'm able to do something with the others now while he's asleep. <laughs> anyway, I told his mother, she said, does he give you any trouble? I said, no, Annie, he doesn't give me any trouble. The only thing is, he's wasting his time in yours because he's asleep every afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> she said, leave him alone. <laughs> she said, he's able to do work with the others. <laughs> and uh, I thought Howard Bushworm might be here this afternoon, but he isn't. Because I thought Howard French. Bad thing was, or the good thing, whichever way you want to look at it, Howard could speak French. I couldn't. <laughs> I could write it, translate it from French to English, and uh, back again from English to French. Anyway, when I'd get home in the night, he tried to teach me how to speak French. <laughs> then, of course, Mr. Yellow would pipe up. Now, it wasn't always the Hail Mary that Paul was trying to teach me. <laughs> but anyway, I'd probably keep you here an hour later if I started to tell you all the things that I was here teaching. But I did enjoy these years, and I deeply appreciate the fact that you invited me here this afternoon. Thank you, one and all.
Uh, my name is Geraldine Calder, and I thought that here I was Geraldine Green. And I was staying with Mary and my Felix. And I was only 17 years old. It was the first time I was away from home. And of course, it was home to me, and they're really nice. My heart will always be in Winter Houses and this one room school. But anyhow, I'm gonna, this has got nothing to do with school. This has to do with Mike and Mary. Uh, I went home one evening from school and to realize that, well, Mike was away in the woods or he was away working, and we had no firewood. So Mary said, Geraldine, she said, would you go around the wood pile and see what you can find as firewood? <laughs> anyhow, I came back into the house and Mary, I said, Mary's not much wood out there, really. But I said, there's the old wood horse out there. Now, you all know what a wood horse is, do you? <laughs> well, Mary said, you can go ahead and cut that up. I said, okay. <laughs> so anyhow, a few days, but the next morning, uh, Emil's boy did bring wood up to Mary. They were supposed to bring the wood, but they had nothing around to it. So a few weeks after, I walked home, because I had a walk a mile in the hill, when walking to Mary's house, here is this man sitting down. I had never met Mike Felix. <laughs> here was this man sitting down, and he was just looking. And Mary said, Mike, she said, this is our teacher. <laughs> oh, dear God. <laughs> oh, he said, you're the one that caught up my wood horse. <laughs> but in, in the meantime, uh, of course, I, I think he must have built another wood horse, I'm sure. But Kay, as you would say, we're all getting older. And there's a lot of people that don't remember, but when I came here in 52, there was only 14 students. And Kay was telling me she had 23. So I told Kay today, she must have drove the rest of them away. <laughs> <laughs> but the, big, uh, the biggest majority was Duffy's, and I gotta remember to tell you this, because uh, my memories are good of all people in, in Winter House and Blackfoot Grove. But anyhow, talking about Mr. or Mrs. Gerald Duffney, this day, I'm not sure it was Bernie or if it was his brother Greg. Anyhow, they came and took me by the hand. They said, Mr., are you going home for dinner? And I said, yes, I had my dinner with him. But he said, are you going to my house for dinner? And <laughs> with a big crowd that they have, I said, I don't know. I said, am I invited to your dinner? Yes, Missy. So anyhow, we go over and they had fried lobster. <laughs> And it was the first time I'd eaten fried lobster. I love lobster, but anyhow, I thought that was the nicest meal. And another evening I had gone home, this is up to Mary Felix's now, and we sat down to our meal, and I thought I was eating trout. And it was a delicious meal. It had been done up with vegetables and different things, only to be told afterwards that it was eels. <laughs> but I thoroughly enjoyed it. <laughs> And then, I don't know if I said, but you know, in those times, uh, you had a one wood, uh, you had the, the, uh, the stove, and lots of times there was no wood in the school. So we would spend a lot of our recess day at time going along to be picking up driftwood. And that's how we kept the stove going until the men brought wood to the school or the coal arrived. And that was, uh, that, that. so I think I said enough. <laughs> but anyhow, thanks for inviting me, and Mary and Michael always have be in my heart, and this school was my first school, so it'll be always something special to me. Okay. I'm one of Anne and Gerald's daughters. Uh, I started kindergarten when Winnie O'Quinn was teaching. I was in grade one and two the same year, because I was smart. <laughs> so I just, that's all I wanted to do. But then I wanted to teach. I wanted to be a teacher. So one day, uh, Winnie was very, very scared of bugs. So I came in, I think it was just after lunch, I put some June bugs in her drawer, and waited. And she opened her drawer, and she screamed and took off. So I... Oh, I was so happy, so I went and sat in the seat, in the teacher's seat, and I smiled, looking at the class. I said, class dismissed. Hello, uh, my name is 
Sylvia Oliver, Sylvia Gall, I was from West Bay, and I taught here from September 1960 to June of 1961. One of the best, best years of my life because the people here, oh, they were so wonderful. In those days, you didn't have too many ways of, uh, you know, socializing and stuff. But I remember the winter at Mrs. Uh, Felix's. I stayed with Mike and Mary. And all oh, the songs and the music and all the, the wonderful times during the big blizzards and everything. The winter just flew by. And I was looking at the things written on the blackboard down there. That brought back memories when they said, I shall not put bugs in the teacher's desk. That is my thing. Every dinner hour, when I came back and opened the drawer of the desk, there was sure to be a whole pile of June bugs in there. That was Fancy Felix and Raymond Felix and uh, Fancy Dauphiné. And, oh, they were real little pirates, I tell you. And then they'd run away. So who did it? I don't know, Miss, but there was always one, always a box, a match box full of June bugs. But I just like to say, well, it brings back a lot of memories. I'm looking at the green walls, too. And I remember when it was painted green, we, uh, we had a dance on a Saturday night, earned enough money to buy the paint. And the kids said, well, this will come. We'll make fire and we'll stay down and, you know, we'll paint it up. And that's what we did. So it made it look a little bit better. Uh, we always thought it was nice, but I guess, you know, it needed a little bit of touching up. But it, it's really nice, the work that you have done. It's beautiful, and it's nice to preserve, I think, uh, such memories. And uh, Mr. and Mrs. Duffney, too, I have fond memories of, of them. People ran over there for everything. I mean, I don't know how they put up, you know, with, with all of us. But it was very nice, and I must say thank you very much for inviting us here today. And uh, I hope you continue to have pride in your heritage and, you know, in this building and, and build up as you as the years go by. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else would like to come up and share some memories? Uh, it's been, uh, been quite a, uh, a list of memories we had here over the years, I guess, and we're hearing them this afternoon. I have to share one more with you, I guess, before we go. Uh, back in grade two, by the way, my name is Robert Felix, I guess I don't know if everybody knows me, but I'm the son of Mike and Mary Felix. Uh, in grade two, of course, Larry Mahoney is here, so learning <laughs> happened then. But yeah, he used to send me over to, to Gerald's house also. But one day, um, one of the reviews, I think, you know, or one of the boys, I guess, were getting on his nerves. So he took the clock and he just let it shrink through the clock at, at one, of the, one of the kids. And the clock went to, springs went flying, of course, so we had no time. No clock, no time to do school clothes, you know. So he sent me over to Gerald's house to get the time. So I come back and it's about 10 minutes to three. And he's got a pencil stuck on the, on, on the window sill there. And the sun is shining, of course, and he marked the line, 10, up, 10 minutes to three. And of course, every day, when the sun would cast a shadow on that line from the pencil, of course, it was closing time, 10 minutes to 3 or 3 o'clock, I guess. But I guess as time went on, the shadow was moving a little further all the time. Our days were getting longer in school. <laughs> so we got a new clock. <laughs> but you know, we used, we used to spend the afternoon, especially in grade 2 with Larry Mahoney, um, we'd say the rosary, as was a, a practice, I guess, that we had every morning when we'd come into church, to church, and come into school, we'd always say a prayer. But what he would do at one o'clock in the afternoon when we came in after, after lunch, we would say the rosary. And, of course, what we would do, he would have every student to say one decade every, de every day. So everybody had a turn, five students today, five students tomorrow. And, and when it came to one afternoon, it came to Hilliard's. Hilliard's turn. I know Hilliard's here this afternoon. Eh? But anyway, um, we all counted on our fingers ten Hail Marys, and then we'd say glory be and go on to the next one. But Hilliard, I guess, forgot to count. And he must have prayed for about an hour and a half. And like, no. <laughs> Nobody told him to stop. <laughs> Somebody tell him to stop. <laughs> 
<laughs> but he kept them going and he kept them praying for the whole afternoon. And by, by the time the rosary was over, this was time to go home. Anyway. <laughs> Anyway, um, it's been great. I'd like to thank everyone for coming out this afternoon. Uh, we certainly shared a lot of memories just from this short, short, short time. Um, I think we've gone through just about we have pretty much everything that we had scheduled to do, and, uh, and that's great. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone once again. Um, if there's anyone else, though, who would like to come up and uh, still share some more memories, we, we're still around. And uh, we'll be open for the next... Grand Banks of Newfoundland. A hundred years before Columbus, the Basques crossed the Atlantic to find the richest fishing grounds in the world. In their wake came the Portuguese, the French, the Spanish, and the British. Newfoundland was to become the scene of two centuries of conflict between the British and the French, as each disputed the other's claim to the island. The political struggle has long passed into history. Only the eternal struggle with the elements still goes on. Salmon, tuna, haddock, and halibut, mackerel, turbot, herring, and sardine abound in these waters. But the biggest catch is cod, the Grand Banks fishermen take out more than a million tons of cod every year. When a Newfoundlander talks about fish, he means cod. <laughs> Equally as important as fishing on the high seas is Newfoundland's inshore fishing. In the late spring, the young squid come inshore in their thousands. Squid is so plentiful in Newfoundland waters that it's become almost an emblem of the island.
In mid-June, cod is lured inshore by the caplin, which are brought in by the tides after spawning time. They could be caught from the shore by anyone handy with a net. A stone throw from his home, the inshore fisherman can pull in huge quantities of cod. His gear includes trawls, traps, and gill nets, as well as hook and line. In addition to the cod, there are, in season, large quantities of herring, salmon, and lobster to be caught. The sea reaches into the island through countless bays, creeks, and inlets. It touches the daily life of all Newfoundlanders, and has formed the pattern of their lives for centuries. They have a fisherman's attitude to the sea, for their ancestors came here primarily as fishermen, not as mariners. A third of the population makes its living from fishing and its allied industries. At Black Duck Brook, they work as they have worked for centuries. The cod are split, gutted, washed, salted, and laid out to dry. These wooden platforms made of boughs are called flakes a common sight along Newfoundland's shores. Drying fish like this in sun and wind is an ancient craft, perhaps as old as man. It seems simple, but care and patience are essential. Perhaps it is a dying craft, for many fishermen now deal directly with the freezing plants. The settlement of Newfoundland was a long, slow process longer than most other colonies of the New World. The rocky, fog-bound coast did not seem as tempting as the adjoining waters, which were teeming with fish. The fishermen from Europe landed on the coast only to make repairs and take on fresh water for their voyage home. It was not until the 19th century that the island's potential was seen, and men looked inland beyond the forbidding shores. Traditionally, the whole family helps bring in the hay, but the rocky soil does not encourage many to farm for a living. Those islanders of French and Acadian descent are proud of their heritage. Black Duck Brook is a French-speaking community, though everyone can speak English too. At school, the children speak only English, and the older people wonder how long they can keep alive the language and traditions of their ancestors.
Since their first fishing expeditions to Newfoundland, the Basques have been part of the island's history. Today they have come from the neighboring French islands of saint pierre et miquelon to take part in festivities marking the occupation of Placentia by the French 300 years ago. Placentia, called by the French Plaisance, was named by the Basques centuries ago when they first discovered the sheltered bay on the southeast corner of the island. The French built a fort at Placentia in 1662 and Louis XIV chose the town as his Newfoundland capital. 75 miles away, the British were established at St. John's. For 50 years, the two countries continued their struggle for supremacy of the island until 1713, when by the terms of the Treaty of Utrecht, the French garrison at Placentia was evacuated and France relinquished her claims to Newfoundland. But the controversy between the two countries continued over French rights to catch and actually go ashore to dry the fish. The matter was resolved when the islands of Saint-Pierre et Miquelon were returned to France in 1763. They have remained French ever since. The first white men to discover Newfoundland were the Vikings. Leif Erikson landed on the North Shore in the year 1000 and founded the settlement of Vinland. But the discovery and naming of the island is generally credited to John Cabot, the Venetian navigator. In the service of Henry VII of England, Cabot landed at Cape Bonavista in 1497. Five years after Columbus's epic voyage, this much visited island was officially discovered. And Terra Incognita became Terra Nova, Newfoundland. A 16th century map viewed from north to south shows a painstaking, if rather inaccurate drawing of Newfoundland. The map maker was guided by notes and sketches provided by Cartier who had explored the Newfoundland coast and found it to be an island. It was on the shores of the Straits of Belle Isle that Cartier came across the first Red Indians, the red-painted Beothics, a Stone Age tribe, which by the 19th century had become extinct. In 1583, the flag of England was raised at St. John's by Sir Humphrey Gilbert. Half-brother to Sir Walter Raleigh, Sir Humphrey took possession of the island in the name of Queen Elizabeth, despite the presence of the French not far away in Placentia Bay. This great natural harbor has for centuries provided a safe, ice-free anchorage for ships of all nations. During World War II, Placentia Bay was a strategic naval base, and it was here aboard a battleship moored at Argentia that Roosevelt and Churchill met to sign the historic Atlantic Charter. Called Britain's oldest colony, Newfoundland is also Canada's youngest province. In 1947, Newfoundlanders were given the choice of self-government, British rule, or union with Canada. Their final choice was Confederation, and Newfoundland with Labrador became Canada's 10th province in 1949. According to geologists, the soil of Newfoundland is perhaps the oldest in the world. Sir Francis Bacon, the 16th century English philosopher, said, the fisheries of Newfoundland are more productive than the mines of Peru. 
He could not have foreseen that one day the mines of Newfoundland would be a major part of the island's economy. And many Newfoundlanders now earn their living working in the flourishing mining industry. The island has substantial deposits of zinc, copper, lead, asbestos, gypsum, and fluor spar, while it supplies more than half the iron ore produced in Canada. In Newfoundland, if a man is not a miner or a fisherman, he may well be a lumberjack. Wood is Newfoundland's greatest source of revenue. The pulp and paper industry brings in more money than iron ore and fish. Northern Newfoundland is a barren, rocky area. But the west side of the island compensates for this, with vast forests of conifers, which supply the raw materials for the pulp and paper mills. Thanks to paper, Cornerbroke, on the Gulf of St. Lawrence, has in the last 40 years grown from a village of 300 to become the island's second largest city with a population of 30,000. The biggest integrated paper mills in the world are at Cornerbrook. On the east coast, St. John's, the provincial capital. Dominating the city is Signal Hill, site of the last battle in Canada between French and English soldiers. St. John's is located at the easternmost tip of North America. In 1901, it was here at the foot of Cabot's Tower that Marconi heard the faint signal of the first transatlantic wireless message. Oldest city on the continent, St. John's has witnessed the ebb and flow of history. And today, the fishing boats of many nations enjoy safe anchorage in the harbor that John Cabot discovered almost 500 years ago. Battered by the sea, these ancient rocks have seen the beginning and the end of the Great Ice Age. They are as old as the world itself. Although it is the 10th biggest island in the world, Newfoundland has only 420,000 inhabitants, scattered mainly along the coast or living in remote inland villages. It is an island of contrast, of youth and age, a land at once rich and poor. It is a land of the future, port of call for the ships and aircraft of the world. Yet it still holds dear the worthy traditions of its former times. <laughs> 